Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We start uh, another paper four. This is the November 2020 uh, paper four one, and this is a few very interesting questions, and uh, we'll be handling these, and we'll be discussing how we're going to uh, be reading these questions, and then answering them in the coming exam of P four uh, very soon. Now let's start the first question, which is a very interesting question because it is going to ask you about C4 plants. So maize is a C4 plant. Question one, figure 1.1, transverse section through a leaf from the maize plant, Z maize. Maize is a C4 plant. Uh, on figure 1.1, use label lines and letters to show A, a cell in the epidermal layer and a cell that contains PEP carboxylase. Now, if you look at the diagram, now I've got this diagram for you all, and uh, look at it, where do you see? You see, what you have to understand is where is the xylem and the phloem, and where are the bundle sheet cells? So everybody needs to be very clear on the this part of the syllabus, which is the bundle sheet cells, and then where are the mesophyll cells? So I would like you to pause the video here, look at it, where they are found, and a portion of a cross-section of a leaf with C4, then there's another one, which is a diagrammatic view. So the bundle sheet cells form this ring around it and the vascular bundle. So these are the bundle sheet cells, which I'm just shading in red. And then you can see the mesophyll cells are the one on the outside. Like here, you see these are the mesophyll cells, the ones outside this. So all these are the mesophyll cells. And then the bundle sheet cells are the ones which we are now going to label this part. So this is the bundle sheet cell. Now, please understand that we need to be very clear on what is the bundle sheet cell and what is the mesophyll cells. Um, so a cell in the epidermal layer, now it's told you that C, now if you, if you understood C, then it was easy because C was the bundle sheet cell. And so if you know the bundle sheet cell and the ones which are outside would be the mesophyll cells. So even this would be the mesophyll cell. This area, this area, this all this area would be the mesophyll cells, which is surrounding the bundle sheet cells. Then the next question was explain how the leaf anatomy, explain how the leaf anatomy shown in figure 1.1 adapts the C4 plant to maintain a high rate of photosynthesis at high temperatures. Now, as everybody knows, C4 plants is what you've got the vascular bundle, then you've got the bundle sheet and the mesophyll cell. So high rate of photosynthesis because you see it, there is less photorespiration. Why? Because we have now kept rubisco away from the air because the air contains oxygen and rubisco has a tendency to combine with oxygen and the RUBP combines with oxygen in the presence of rubisco and that is called photorespiration. So when we have separated them, now we've kept them away from the oxygen. So the rubisco cannot bind with the oxygen. So the first mark scheme point, as it says, is decreases photorespiration. But you need to revise this part of the syllabus if you are not clear on this. The mesophyll cells form a ring around the bundle sheet cells. So oxygen cannot reach the bundle sheet cell. And oxygen cannot bind to RUBP or, if you said, rubisco in the bundle sheet cell. This BSC is bundle sheet cell. And much carbon dioxide in the bundle sheet cell, where, where of course, the Calvin cycle is going to take place in the bundle sheet cell. So we've kept them away. So we've kept them away so that the RUBP does not combine with oxygen and photorespiration does not take place. So the C part of the question, figure 1.2, shows the results of an experiment comparing the rates of carbon dioxide uptake in a C3 plant and a C4 plant in high and low carbon dioxide conditions. So we have four graphs. First of all, you've got to understand which graph is which one. So C4 plants in high carbon dioxide. So let's give it a different color. So this one is the C4 plant. So C4 plants in high carbon dioxide is which one? As you can see, what are we saying? We are seeing C4 plants. I've given that a green color. Then C4 plants. So this was uh, C4 plants in high carbon dioxide. Then C4 plants in low carbon dioxide. So this was the red one which I have uh, labeled in red and this is the one which we are looking at. Now this whole thing you must do to yourself when you're reading this question. And then of course we have C3. C3 is the one which I have sort of given the yellow shade. 
So this is the C3 and the C3 increases and then decreases. And then of course we have the C3. So, so this, this is C3 and this is C3. So we've got two C3s and we've got two C4s. So here we've got the C3 again here. And this is the C3 that you're seeing here. This is the graph that we're seeing for C3 here. And then we've got two C4s. So we need to really pause here and look at these graphs. And then because we're going to see the question here. So I want you to look at this, question, this graph. And then of course, I want you to read the question. Using figure 1.2, compare the rates of photosynthesis in high CO2 conditions in the C3 and C4 fluid. So they wanted you to be only comparing what? They wanted you to only compare high carbon dioxide. So in this, what are you going to compare now? So you're going to, let's look at the, let's look at the graph again. And uh, you see the high carbon dioxide. So high carbon dioxide would mean we are only comparing this one and we are only comparing the, the green and the yellow one. So we are only comparing these two. Whenever it says compare, so you must give me a very, very fair comparison. This has this, this does not have this, this has this. So as temperature increases, rate increases up to 25. As temperature increases, rate decreases above 35. And then C3 rate is higher at low temperature. C3 rate is lower at high temperature. C3 peaks at 25 and C4. So if you're going to give me the peaks, you must give me the peaks of both the graphs. So whenever they ask you to compare, like if I say if I'm comparing two students and I say, oh, well, he wears glasses and he doesn't wear glasses. So, or he is taller or he is shorter. So C3 peak at 25 and C4 peak at 30 or 35 between this and this. Then C3 has a lower peak. So whenever when we have a comparison, we're going to use the word lower higher so these are the ones that we need to be remembering whenever we're doing a compare question we got to use these words in which this is a comparative statement this is higher than this or this is lower than this so c3 has a lower peak c3 has a lower optimum temperature then the part two of the question was using figure 1.2 compare the rate of photosynthesis in low and high carbon dioxide conditions in the c4 plant between 30 and 35 degrees and suggest an explanation for the difference. So this is now you see two marks. So first of all, the comparative statement is going to get you one mark and then the explanation is going to get you one mark. So it's not just if you can write both these points, I'm not going to give you two out of two. I'm only going to give you one because you did not give me any mark for the explanation. You did not give me an explanation. So if it says compare and then it says explain. So you have to remember is that there is got to be one mark for the compare and one mark for the explanation. So rate is higher at high carbon dioxide conditions, rate is maximum for both. And the explanation is that CO2 is the limiting factor. In low CO2 conditions, naturally if CO2 is less, well that is a very important uh, part of the Kelvin cycle, carbon dioxide fixation. So if there's no carbon dioxide fixation, how can the Kelvin cycle continue? So CO2 is the limiting factor in low carbon dioxide concentration. And that is the important thing. You might have known it, but if you didn't write it, well, I'm not going to give you any marks because it says a compare and explain. Now let's look at question two, which is a very, very, you know, and usually when I see such a lot of written stuff, you know, uh, I usually say, Mujhe bukhar ho jata, uh, which means that, you know, I get very stressed out. So domestic goats are small herbivorous animals that provide milk for human use. And goat's milk is an important source of food for people. So read the question carefully. I mean, enjoy it. Don't stress yourself like I stress myself a lot when I read such a lot of st stuff. So they've given you some information, small herbivore animals that provide milk. Goat's milk is an important source of food for people. So naturally, if people had goats, they would be making money and they would be selling the milk in the market. Then they've given you these two funny weird names, uh, which is I always say XS and G. So Zinong, Sanen, and Guangzong, I mean, the names appear very, very difficult. I can't even pronounce them. So XS and G are the names of two varieties or two breeds of goat common in China. Fine. In these breeds, there is genetic variation. At nucleotide position 5752 of a gene coding for a growth factor. So there's genetic variation. So some will have probably have more growth, some will have less growth. 
because of a genetic variation at the nucleotide position. At this position, there is either a cytosine or a guanine. So you know, you know, DNA has A, T, G, C. This is the normal base sequences. Some individuals are homozygous for the allele containing C at this position. So the homozygous ones, as we know, are double C. Some are homozygous for the allele containing G. So these are double G, double G. And some are heterozygous. So we've got three possibilities. The genetic variation is three different combinations. Double C, double C homozygous. And uh, double G, double G homozygous at G. And some are heterozygous. Now, table 2.1 compares the mean milk yield of the first milk producing period, which is the first lactation, which means they have uh, they've had the baby and then they are lactating. So that's called the first lactation. And the next milk producing period is the second lactation. They have the second offspring and then the period in which they are going to be uh, um, giving milk. So S, uh, XS of each genotype. So basically, we started off with two. We started the story with two different breeds. But now, we're only talking of one breed. We're only talking of the XS. I've just sort of abbreviated it XX just to make it easier for me because I can't read the whole name. It's a little difficult. Now, in table 2.1, let's look at table 2.1. Genotype position. Genotype at position 5752 was this CC and CG. And then GG. Now let's look at the first lactation. 679 goes up to 940. And the mean milk in yield per kilogram. And CG was 622. And went up to 858. Right? And this was 616 and went. So all of them have gone up in the second lactation. That's a common factor. So all of them, 6799, some have gone up less, some have gone up more. So we have these different, so look at the common factors and then sort of read the question again and then of course try to follow your gut and do the question. Now part A1 says variation in a phenotypic characteristic such as milk yield is caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Number one, genetics. Number two, environmental factors. Naturally, if they get more food, and they'll give more milk or they will grow more, something like that. So think of the life, genetic, fine, and environmental factor. Just like when we are talking of uh, your person has uh, the genetic information to be 5, 8, to be tall. But then that person did not get enough diet or was deprived of proteins or was very sick as a child or when he was in his teens, he didn't get enough proteins in his diet. So he did not grow tall or a plant did not get enough nitrates from the soil. So it did not grow tall. Now, goats also show variation in milk yield between the first lactation and the second lactation. Suggest with reasons whether the variation in milk yield between the first lactation and the second lactation is genetic or environmental. This was a little difficult because it says suggest, I always say are the difficult questions. Suggest with reason whether the variation between the first and the second is genetic or environmental. Well, why is it environmental, not genetic? That has to be the first important point. Because as change in the yield, we are only discussing one goat. We did not discuss the other one. We are only discussing excess as Zing, Zin, Zwang, that one. And the yield increases in all the genotypes. So, I mean, we are not seeing a lot of variation. There's a slight variation, but there's not a lot of variation that one of them was more in the first lactation and less in the second lactation. But they're all increasing in uh, yield increases in all the genotypes. Then older goats have more developed udders. Udders is the mammary glands which produce uh, milk. So they have more, they're grown more. And then age or maturity is an environmental factor because you see, what are we doing? We are comparing the first lactation and the second lactation. So the second lactation would be a year or two later. So the animal would have grown. So this was a very gut feeling question in which you had to think is because they're not many pointers towards the genetic side. They're more pointers towards the environmental factors that they had more food, so second lactation, more. So that was more of an environmental factor. It wasn't a genetic factor. Plus, we didn't have any genetics. We only had one type of goat that we were considering. We did not have information on the other breed to compare, okay, this one has so much milk, and what about the other breed? Did it have more milk? If it had more milk in first and second lactation, then definitely it was genetics. But we did not give you any data on that. Then the part two of the question, 
was the variation at position 5752 of the gene coding for a growth factor is due to a substitute mutation from G to C with reference to table 2.1 describe the importance of the substitution from G to C now C C will increase as milk yield more income benefit for people small effects in heterozygous little difference between G G and C G so you see what you had to see was that this was having more milk more milk means more describe the importance more milk means more economic benefit more milk to be sold and in the heterozygous there was little difference so that is what you had to get from the previous table which i have just talked about then coming to the b part of the question this was in hardy weinberg either you know hardy weinberg or you don't know it that's the simple thing i always say in a population of 268 the frequency of the clnq is 0.30 p is 0.70 Hardy Weinberg, then you have this formula, which is we all know this, and then of course you use the Hardy Weinberg principle. I won't go into details on this, is because the reason is that Hardy Weinberg is a totally different thing, and if you have problems in that, you need to really figure that out first, or otherwise you just need to leave these two marks. You need you need not do this question then, just leave the two marks because either you know it or you don't know it. Then it says table 2.2 shows the actual number of goats with each genotype in a population of Zhenong, Sinan, and a population of Guangzhou. So populations, total number of goats 268, 440, number of goats of each genotype. So we have 22, 116, 130, 47, 69, 324. The allele frequency was this, and all that kahani. Then a close match between your predicted figure and actual numbers in table 2.1 would mean that Zhong Sen population is in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. State the name of a statistical test that would be used to find out whether or not the Zhong Sen population is in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Well, then you do whenever there is a question in which you do predicted, in which you do predicted figures and observed figures and expected figures, then it's a chi-square test. So the chi-square test would have to be done in this uh, sort of situation. Then the predicted numbers of goats with each genotype in the Zhong Zhong population, according to the Heidi Weinberg, are 16, 135, 289. This was the fact that they was given to you. But actually, what are they? Actually, you had to go it from here: 47, 69, and 324. So you looked at it; they weren't the same. There was a there was a lot of difference. The figures are significantly different from the actual figures in Table 2.2. With reference to Table 2.2, describe the evidence that shows that the Zhong Zhong population is not in Hardy Weinberg. CC is higher than predicted; is 47 instead of 16. There could be migration, immigration, emigration. Immigration means out, emi means emi means inside. So emi, emi, these are the different words. There could be genetic drift, could be non-random mating, and could be artificial selection for high milk yield. So this was one mark. Because you three marks here, so one mark was reference describe the evidence. So this was the evidence, and suggest reasons. The reasons would be any two out of these. So please remember, whenever it says we describe the evidence, so there would be one mark for the evidence, and there would be two marks for the reason because this is a three mark question. So you have to always read the question and see what are they asking. If there are two different things that they are asking, then there will be one mark for that and two marks for that. So if you didn't give me this, you had to get give me CC is higher than predicted, and then of course you had to give me any two from these uh, migration, immigration, and genetic drift, and of course these are of course points which are given in your book. When does the Hardy Weinberg doesn't work, and those are the factors in which it doesn't work. The last part of the question was a little simple. Goats can be genetically modified to produce human proteins in their milk. In 2009, an anti-clotting protein produced in this way was approved for use as a drug in people who lack this protein. State one ethical advantage and one ethical problem of producing medicinal drugs from milk of genetically modified goats. Advantage, naturally, advantage if you have some treatment that you can treat the people, so you can alleviate sufferings, you can reduce their sufferings, or you can reduce or treat a disease. Problem is that you know we don't know when we give them these sort of products which we have got from uh, genetically modified animals. They might contain allergens, and people might be allergic to it, and the process may harm the goats. And uh, vegetarians may not even take the drug because they do not believe in any animal products. So those are sort of those points which you come up with 
in any of these questions and when in ever where there's a tr- problem in any genetically modified organisms use is that you know could be allergic we don't know what the effects are could cause an immune response could cause of course and then the and the this is of course it's not a bacteria which we have genetically modified this is we're working on genetically modified goats and we don't know what harm we were doing to them so this is of course the point which as a biologist you have to think whenever they ask you a problem like this then coming to the third question uh, dna barcoding dna barcoding is used in species identification to create a dna barcode a specific region of dna is sequenced so that it can be compared to an online database of reference dna one region of dna that is commonly used is 648 base pairs long with a mitochondrial gene within a mitochondrial gene coding for the enzyme cytochrome c oxidase 1 the solitary sandpiper whatever is a migratory bird okay so we're talking about birds dna barcoding has shown that approximately 2.5 million years ago ts evolved into two subspecies tss and tsc a subspecies is a genetically distinct population of a species that has some phenotypic differences but is not yet reproductively isolated tss breed in eastern north america whereas tsc breed in western north america now i've just given it abbreviation just to make it easy because i can't be reading the whole name it uh, i think it makes me a little uh, confused when i read the whole name so this is tss this is tsc in a western north america suggest and explain how suggest and explain how two subspecies tss and tsc could have evolved from the original ts population now what is this what is it what is this question it's a very basic thing we all know what is this question it is all about speciation so in speciation what do you have to give me the very simple things which we have given nearly in every question up till now geographical isolation between populations less gene flow different mutations occur different selection pressures natural selection genetic drift allopatric speciation so things which we write in every speciation question is what we are going to write here as well b part of the question was figure 3.1 shows an american oyster catcher whatever hp the black oyster catcher hb has all black feathers DNA barcoding analysis suggests that the American oyster catcher and the black oyster catcher are not separate species. Suggest how DNA barcoding evidence could indicate that the American oyster catcher and the black oyster catcher are not separate species. You know, very basic uh, mitochondrial DNA base sequences nearly identical, and a small number of bases are different. Then it comes to the C part of the question was again something which they expect you to know in your syllabus. The Custom officers at airports use a handheld DNA barcoding device to identify biological specimens entering or leaving a country. Suggest how this helps protect endangered species. Naturally, identify species very quickly. Compare with the IUCN red list. Relocate endangered species. Stop activities of smugglers. Prevent entry of predators that could harm the native endangered species. So. very general very basic only two marks you had to think very rationally how this was going to help now coming to the last question the question 4 uh, there are a number of mutations affecting the production of fetal hemoglobin hbf and normal adult hemoglobin the hba allele codes for the normal beta globin polypeptide so hba is the normal one and the hbs allele codes for the base substitution mutation code for an abnormal beta globin the base substitution results in the amino acid glutamine which has a polar r group to be replaced by valine which has a non polar r group so globular protein hydrophilic r groups on the outside now there will be a hydrophobic r group on the outside the abnormal hemoglobin molecule hbs form fibers in low partial pressures of oxygen the fibers cause red blood cells to become sickle shell and uh, sickle cell shaped and the cells can block blood capillaries individuals with adult hemoglobin molecule that are, are all abnormal hbs have sickle cell anemia this is a painful chronic condition that can be life threatening so you read the whole question and then you continue 
explain why this mutation causes the HBS to form fibers. Naturally, because you've got now a changed amino acid, which was again given in the question, and a non-polar R group forms different bonds. So the HBS molecules now stick together. Now, even if you didn't know it, you could have just taken this out of the question and you could have given me this information. I have a whole lot of information. When I look at it, I mean, I get... I get very vexed and I get very uh, I upset, so I'm trying not to be upset. So HBF, fetal hemoglobin, is produced by the fetus until just before birth, when adult hemoglobin begins to be made. So in the fetal state, we have HBF, and then in the adult state, this, this stops. By the age of six months, adult hemoglobin has replaced most of the HBF. This change occurs when the gene coding for HBF are switched off, and the gene coding for the adult hemoglobin are switched on. So in the fetus, the HBF would be switched on, on, and then as soon as the fetus is born, and now it's a baby, we don't call it a fetus, a base substitution, British 198, causes fetal hemoglobin to continue to be produced. Normally, by the age of six months, the concentration of HBF reduces to less than 1% of total hemoglobin. So when the baby is about uh, six months old, then we have just a little bit of HBF, 1%. With the British 198 mutation, the concentration of HBF may be as high as 20%. So instead of 1%, it is 20% of the total hemoglobin in an adult. HBF has a higher affinity of, for oxygen at low partial pressure of oxygen than adult hemoglobin. So PO2, pressure of oxygen. Now, individuals who have both sickle cell anemia and British 198 mutation have reduced symptoms of sickle cell anemia. Suggest so why having the British 198 mutation reduces the symptoms of sickle cell anemia. Mostly things from the question you're picking up, both HBF and HBS present, decreases HBS fiber formation, fewer red blood cells change shape, avoids very low PO2 in the blood. So everything was from the question. Nothing was just something that you had to know beforehand. You had to just pick up things from the question and that is one of the biggest exam skill you need to develop. Two, in adults with a British 198 mutation, the gene coding for a fetal hemoglobin polypeptide remains switched on. This is due to the presence of a protein that controls gene expression. State the term, transcription factor. Then the C part gel electrophoresis can be carried out to test individuals for the different versions of hemoglobin, HBA, HBS, and HBF. A buffer with alkaline pH is used to make all hemoglobin molecules negatively charged. HBS molecules have an additional positive charge compared to HBA. Describe and explain how gel electrophoresis is used to diagnose sickle cell anemia. Electric field across the gel, one mark. Protein moves to the positive electrode. HBS moves more slowly. HBS moves shorter distance. Compare um, the band positions of known hemoglobin bands. If single band seen at HBS position, person has sickle cell anemia. So you have to just know this was something which was a very direct question. If you know it, you should have learned this uh, from your, it's part of the syllabus, and you, I'm sure all of you know this. Last part, four individuals had their hemoglobin analyzed by gel electrophoresis. One of the individuals was heterozygous for HBHBS and had a condition known as sickle cell trait. Some of the results are shown. This was given to you in the here. We had all this was given to you. And then you had to figure this out, individual with normal phenotype, this was given. So one month old baby with normal phenotype, so had to have the hemoglobin HBA and HBF. Uh, this was here, what we are seeing here. I have labeled these, I've given them different colors. Then lane three, individual with sickle cell trait, so that means he had HBA and HBS. So this is the red and the yellow. Then with sickle cell anemia was of course HBS, HBS. And this was, of course, the reference which was given to you. I've just shaded them different colors to give you an idea. And thank you very much. And we'll continue the rest of this on another video.